board go. Okay, welcome everyone. Success. And we are, uh, this is our workshop number three, um, the development of the IEP and instructional considerations uh, for a duly identified uh, person. I'm Robin Fleck um, and uh, ESOL consultant. And Leora, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Leora Byrus. I work for the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education and I liaise with Robin um, to help with uh, multilingual learners who may have disabilities in Maine. And we've had a really great collaboration. Oh, I'm gonna, okay, hold on. <laughs> I don't know what is going on here. I'm having some difficulties. Okay, I got this. Can you guys see the subtitle thing on the bottom? It says they're currently okay, there it goes. Okay. okay, perfect. Here we go. Okay, so we hope that uh, you will um, get some of these learning objectives. We hope to provide information regarding information to consider when developing an IEP for multilingual learners. We hope that you'll have information regarding some instructional considerations for duly identified multilingual learners. And we're providing information regarding mock case studies of duly identified multilingual learners or those that could potentially be duly identified um, that are presented in the guidance manual. And this last uh, learning objective is as a result of the surveys that um, have been completed in past webinars. People asked to have those case studies included. Just a quick note, a review, if you've been working with us in the past, um, but here in the state of Maine, we have moved to the term multilingual learners uh, whereas the federal government refers to students as English learners. So students with a primary or home language other than English who are not yet proficient in English, we are referring to as multilingual learners. And we choose um, this language because we wanna be asset-based and emphasizing the strengths and skills that our students bring to school um, and as well as the importance of supporting the development of all languages. And again, just a little bit about the manual. It was created in response to the needs expressed by all of you in the field. And we did um, base the organization of the document on the Virginia Department of Education handbook and had their permission for that. And it was authored through a cross team collaboration between um, ESOL bilingual programs and special services and inclusive education. And the people involved are listed here, myself being one of them. And the manual does include all of these components that are listed and today we are focusing on the development of the IEP and uh, the instructional considerations piece. Okay, so piggybacking on the use of the multilingual learner term in the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education, we are beginning to transition to the use of the the use of the term exceptionality, which is more of an asset-based asset term rather than disability. But of course, IDEA um, is still uh, using the term disability. So you may hear us transitioning to that word, um, but it is in sort of an unofficial capacity because um, legally the term is still disability. So when we talk about developing an IEP for a multilingual learner, who may have a disability. Um, in our last session, we talked about the evaluation process and the importance of um, having people 
having interpreters who are trained in the, the student's home language and following all of the evaluative timelines according to MUSER, the main unified special education regulations. Um, so when a student is found eligible for, for special education services, uh, the team has determined that they require an individual education plan in order to access FAPE, a free appropriate public education. And the IEP itself is a document that lists all of the services and goals and present levels, just for an example, that um, the team has deemed um, the most important to work on over the life of that IEP, which is of course 364 days. So once the, team, once the child is found eligible, the team needs to uh, meet within 30 calendar days um, to develop the IEP. And it's, it, and the parents need to be involved in that, obviously, um, and we'll get to the members of the IET, IEP team specifically in, in just a slide or two. Um, it's also hugely important that the ESOL teacher or another representative in the second language acquisition process is involved with that IEP team because the ILAP, the Individual Language um, Acquisition Plan, um, works with the IEP, the Individual Education Plan, to help meet the needs of multilingual learners who have exceptionalities so that they can be they can access their education. Um, and also, it's, it's very, very important that an interpreter be made available, and there's a little bit more on this later on. And you'll also notice on many of our slides, we have our user citations so that if you're kind of a law nerd um, and you want to go back and look at that information, you are, it, it's right there for you, easily accessible. So an IEP should include the appropriate instructional program or a combination of programs. So that's where the ILAP and the IEP really works together to access the student, to address the student's academic, functional and language needs. So the plan is both academic and functional. So if the child, for instance, has goals um, related to language acquisition, they may be in the functional um, part of the IEP if the team has decided that goals on the IEP would be most appropriate for the child. Um, and again, another note that multilingual learners with disabilities are entitled to equitable access to all language acquisition program types offered by the school, including bilingual programs where applicable. So it is completely appropriate if a child is identified with an exceptionality that they would get both ESOL services and specially designed instruction to meet those needs. So who is on the IEP team? And I took this directly out of MUSER. So whenever possible, the student, the student should be at their IEP meeting if at all possible. You know, my kids, some of them were able to attend. Um, some were able to attend for, you know, a, a very finite amount of time. And, and we would plan for that as part of the IEP team meeting. Um, some were able to attend with fidgets and paper to draw and things like that. But the student is, I mean, all the plan is about them. So if they are able to attend, then, um, you know, even with accommodations to help with that, please, please try to do that. The student's parents, and of course, when we're talking about um, a family whose um, language of origin is not English, we would also be talking about an interpreter, right? Because we wanna make sure that the family understands what the team is discussing at the table. So there needs to be at least one general education teacher, and there needs to be at least one special education teacher. And that would also include any related service providers that may be working with the IEP team um, on the programming for that particular child. It could be that they have you know, occupational therapy needs that are addressed in the IEP. So in that case, the OT would also need to be at the meeting to discuss any progress on goals, et cetera. Uh, there needs to be a school administrator at an IEP team meeting, and that person needs to have knowledge about the special education process and needs to have um, a form in writing that they are allowed to 
uh, use funds, um, special education funds for the district. Um, they can um, make those decisions about, you know, spending money on the on the district's behalf um, to to ensure that this particular student is able to access FAPE. Um, and there also needs to be a person who can interpret any evaluation um, results that are being gone over at the meeting, and that very well could be somebody who's already on the list. It could be the special education teacher, or if it's OT testing, it could be the OT, for example. And then um, there's also a caveat, which is at the discretion of the parents or the agency, other individuals who have knowledge or special expertise regarding the child, including related service personnel as appropriate, and the determination of knowledge or special expertise of an individual described, shall be made by the party, parent or public agency who invited the individual to be a member of the IEP team. So when we think about what those two things really mean specific to a multilingual learner, we're really talking about the ESL teacher and the interpreter. Those are hugely important parts of the, um, the people who are programming for the multilingual learner. So it's very important that that those two people be at the table as well. And additionally, we have a frequently asked question um, that Robin comes across often, which is, can a family member interpret during meetings? And the answer is really no, because, so, um, you know, one of the examples is that, you know, the parents show up at the meeting, they may have an older sibling you know, maybe a, a 20 year old sibling with them for support at the meeting. And they may say, oh, you know, my daughter here can interpret for us, or they wouldn't say it, the daughter would say it, right? You know, I can interpret for my family, you know, we're good, we don't need anybody. And there's some issues with that, right? Because she probably doesn't have the, um, the educational terminology. And we know that with um, special education and with multilingual learners, there's that alphabet soup stuff, you know, there's all the, um, there's ESOL and there's SDI and there's, you know, all of those um, uh, letters and what do they mean? And it's very possible that somebody who's not directly involved um, with those uh, two fields wouldn't know that information. And of course, it's very important that whoever is interpreting can explain those terms to the family. And it could be that, you know, the older sister might not want to get her younger sibling in trouble. So if they're, you know, if the if the general ed teacher is talking about the child being, you know, two grades below in math, for instance, you know, the older sister might not want to say that to the parents because they don't want the parents to have this negative thought about, you know, the younger sibling. So it's really best practice to have an interpreter who is knowledgeable about the education education practice and terminology who is not um, a member of the student's family. Um, Jessica asked, do language line interpreters, I don't know, Robin, have you had experience with the, the language line folks? I have, don't have experience with that particular agency, but what I would say to that is that when you make the request that you let um, them know upfront what type of meeting it is going to be, uh, and it's also useful, whether it be a phone translation uh, interpreting service or an in-person, um, particularly if it's the first time that you are contracting with someone, that you do have a pre-meeting with um, the interpreter and the special education staff member who is going to be um, working with the IP team so that they can review uh, some of the terminology uh, so that they are certain that the person is familiar. And sometimes that can just take a couple of minutes and sometimes it might have to be a more lengthy conversation. Um, but that's a great question. And so you need upfront, um, that would also go for um, health terms. So if within the IEP, there's, um, you know, something comes up around occupational therapy or physical therapy speech. Again, that's specialized terminology. 
So there's an addition um, to the question, a comment, that unfortunately the way it works is you call in as needed and they assign someone at that moment, which is difficult. So this is another one of those situations where what we might say is best practice might not be available on this particular language um, translation service. Although um, I, I do think that you have the capacity because you know when your IEP is going to happen to see if you can call that number uh, and talk to somebody um, to make arrangements um, for that specific time with um, the most knowledgeable person that they have around educational services. Worth a try. Worth a try for sure. Oops, okay. Um, so as I stated earlier, it is entirely appropriate if um, an MLL student has also been um, identified as a student with an exceptionality that they get both special education services and um, ILAP services. So though the IEP team and the language Act acquisition committee, the LAC, will work together to decide the amount and types of services that are appropriate for the student so that they can um, access FAPE. And um, the parents of, oh, we should have changed that, Yield. The parents of multilingual learners with an IEP must be informed of how the language instruction education program meets the objectives of the child IEP. So, um, and, and objectives in this, particular term doesn't necessarily mean objectives in the special education IEP, like, um, you know, for billing purposes or if the child takes the alternate assessment. So I think in this particular example, objectives means more of, you know, the goals of the child. I know that objectives can be a little bit tricky because there's a couple of different meanings for it. Um, so this is part of the manual, um, and you'll see that it's also cited to Muser of where to find all the information. So this is a comparison of the IEP and the ILAP. So um, it looks at what are the legal references. So for the ILAP, this comes out of the Civil Rights Act um, of 1964-1974, and it, acts, it, it um, addresses right to access education, including instruction to learn English. So that's where, where ILAPS came from in the very beginning. Um, and of course, IEPs come out of the Individuals with Disabilities Act, IDEA, which ensures that students with exceptionalities have access to FAPE. Um, the education team, if you're talking about um, a language acquisition committee, oversees programming and progress of the multilingual learners. And it would include, it, it would co-occur with an IEP if needed, MTT, MTSS or RTI is needed, um, student meetings with the ESOL teacher in attendance. So even if it's not an IEP team meeting, the ESOL teacher should be at whatever meetings are happening for that multilingual learner. Um, and of course, the IEP team oversees the development and progress of the student's individual learning goal. Um, and then the purpose, the purpose of an ILAP, the Individual Language Acquisition Plan, is to um, make sure that individual student language goals are developed along with identified supports and accommodations, which of course um, mirrors very much the IEP, which is um, the the pieces that the child needs for support. Um, and it's a written statement of the, the programming that will meet that child's needs and access. Um, the other, some of the other pieces of an ILAP are goals and objectives. So these are the English language de uh, development program services and support are specific to the student's level of English language proficiency in the area of focus on an ILAP, social and academic language of reading, writing, listening, speaking across language arts, math, science, and social studies. And if you are a special education person, then you know that that also mirrors an IEP where we look at the academic piece of 
um, reading, um, listening, speaking, et cetera, um, to look at those ac academic means. And then the functional side of the IEP, look at those social needs, any related services, communication, et cetera. Um, and the, of course the IEP also has um, SDI and related services that are specific to the IEP goals. Um, so those are in alignment with, with the goals that the child is working on. Um, okay, so for assessment, ILAP goals are measured by annual summative and formative assessments for English language proficiency. So that would be access for, for multilingual learners, the alternate access for that um, very small group of students who may need the alternate access. Um, WIDA rubrics and proficiency level descriptors. Um, the assessment with an IEP is making sure that the annual goals are measurable and that they're aligned to skill gaps that are identified as eligibility evaluations. And of course, those are measured um, during progress monitoring. Uh, reporting, this is that progress monitoring piece that I just mentioned. So um, for an ILAP, progress is reported to the parents annually and with each grading period. And it's the same with an IEP, that progress is reported at the annual review of the IEP meeting and then at each grading period. So each time in general education um, is issuing a report card, then the ILAP and the IEP would also uh, be progress monitored and, and that should be issued as well. Um, and the last piece of responsibility. So the goals and the services are documented by the ESOL teacher in collaboration with the classroom teacher and the language acquisition commit committee and filed to the student's cumulative file. That's for the ILAP, of course. And with the IEP, is developed and maintained by the IEP team under the direction of the special education leader. And very often it's the special education teacher who is the case manager of that particular um, student. So how do you are, oh, Yes. Can I just back up for one of second? Of course. Sorry about that. I didn't hit nope. you. Un uh, unmute quick enough. Um, I just want to make note we are in the access testing window right now. And in case there's anyone wondering, um, a student would only be taking the alternate access if they have alternate assessments written in an IEP um, and that that is noted um, that they're an alternate assessment person. Uh, in uh, Synergy, and a student would only be using accommodations uh, in for their access testing, again, if those accommodations are written in a student's IEP. Okay, so if there's any questions about that, we can, um, you know, talk about that at the end. People can ask questions about that. Um, All right, thank you, Robin. So how do you document an ILAP in the IEP? And for those of you who are here from special education, this is now in our um, IEP PD. So that um, you know over two hour training that we do that goes through each section of the IEP in great detail. This is one of the examples that is used for section six of the IEP um, to help with um, alignment between uh, you know, guidance for the um, MLL students and for um, special, ed special education students. So you can see in this example, this is section 6A of the IEP and it's cut off a little bit on the side, but you can see in the top box, we have the ILAP, which is the Individual Language Acquisition Plan. Um, and that is an accommodation that can be used across all of the classroom instruction and assessments in both special education and general education as needed. Um, and it's important that that be part of this document so that everybody on the student's team is aware that the child is a multilingual learner and it really emphasizes the importance of that plan and um, 
the the uh, influence that it, it could have on that student's access to faith, right? Because they need that in order to access faith. Anything you wanna add with this piece, Robin? Okay, all right. Okay, did you wanna to talk to this one? Or do you want me to talk to this one? Oh, hold on. Uh, how are districts being notified of this update addition so teams can be in apply a compliance? That's a great question. Um, we, again, we're rolling it out in this training. We rolled it out in the, the second session of this webinar series, and we have put it in our professional development. Um, and we can talk, I can talk with Colette, who's the federal programs coordinator and the rest of the team that I'm on, um, and, and talk about how we might want to ensure that the field has that information that great point, Melissa. So we'll talk about that um, that piece and see where we can make sure that that happens. You got it. All yeah. right. And so we know that multilingual learners with disabilities are entitled to the same ESOL programming services as multilingual learners without a disability. And we often get questions of well, our multilingual learner is just identified with a disability, so how do we exit them from ESOL services? And the answer is we don't, all right? They are entitled to um, have both services, and these are the service provision guidelines um, that if you are an ESOL teacher, um, hopefully you have seen these before, but they are um, posted on the Multilingual Learner webpage, uh, and they are in the guidance manual. Uh, so if a student uh, has a composite access score of level 1.0 to 2.9, the recommendation is at, at least two periods per day of service. And a period is defined by what a typical period in your school is. So that if you're in a high school with 80 minute blocks, okay, then a period is considered 80 minutes. You know, if you're working in an elementary school and math is 60 minutes, okay, or English or language arts is a certain length of time, then that's how you define your period length. And then one period of service per day for levels 3.0 to 4.5, 4.5 being the score where a student can exit from services. Uh, and so sometimes with a student who needs a great deal of support, this is where the collaboration between um, the special educators and the ESOL educators um, has to really work um, because there aren't enough hours in the day sometimes <laughs> to <laughs> be able to do all that's written into the IEP and then include, um, meet these service provision guidelines. So that's where um, collaboration can happen and teachers can work together and provide services um, in a collaborative manner, okay? Um, but it does take um, planning and uh, these, uh, there should be a voice for the teachers to the administration that that collaboration um, piece is so critical and needs to happen in order for those services to be provided. And I'll, I'll just add here that service times for special education for the specially designed instruction are, are different than one period or two periods. Um, it's based on the amount of time that the IEP team feels that that particular child needs to work on those goals. So um, a team may decide that a child needs, you know, 45 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day. So those times, um, on an IEP are likely to look different than the times are listed on an ILAB just because of, of that. Um, so we as an Aussie team um, did some translated documents last spring. 
So Mass we came across these, Massachusetts had these great uh, special education term glossaries. So we got these terms um, translated into Arabic, Mandarin, Khmer, Somali, Vietnamese, Portuguese, French, and Spanish. And those are located at that link um, on our DOE website. And they're on both the family tab and on the student resources page of this the special ed. Um, you can, you know what I'm going to do? You know what? It's a PDF and those don't always work. You know what? I'm going to put my name and email. I think we did this last time too in the chat box. And if you email me, I will send you a PDF of this right after we're done. So there it is. Um, so if you want this, there you go. Just email me and I'll send it right out. You got it. Okay. Um, so that's where those live, these live. And they also are with the translated procedural safeguards. The procedural safeguards are translated into Arabic, Mandarin, Commerce, Somali, Vietnamese, French, and Spanish. And you'll probably notice that I didn't say Portuguese because we haven't had them translated into Portuguese yet as a state. But there is a super secret district that has translated them into Portuguese. And um, the director is fantastic and lovely. So if you have a need for the Portuguese translated documents, you can contact me as well and I can um, help facilitate that uh, for you. All right, so case studies, Robin. Yes, we're going to, um, these case studies are in the guidance manual and as I said earlier, we had a request to go through them. So we thought we'd take a little time and um, we hope that uh, by reviewing these, it will bring up questions that you may have um, as we go through. So meet Fatima. Fatima was born in Somalia. She moved to the US and entered seventh grade at the age of 13. Fatima speaks Somali. Her English language proficiency is at the entering level, level one. She likes to help with housekeeping chores at home. She likes going to school and wants to learn. Her background experience, Fatima's mother died when she was six, six years old. Her father immigrated to the US shortly after with two of his children, leaving Fatima behind to live with her grandmother. Fatima spent most of her time at home cooking and cleaning. She did not attend school until moving to a refugee camp in Kenya at the age of 10, where she was taught basic English skills. Fatima moved to the US to be reunited with her father in Maine. Okay, so, at, oh, did you want me to do this no, one? No, yes, please do. Okay, perfect. All right, so at the time of enrollment, the intake staff learned that Fatuma is suspected of having a disability that has not been previously diagnosed. Fatuma has a noticeable imbalance when she walks. Her father reported that her hip did not grow correctly and causes her to fall at times. Fatuma did not start speaking until she was four years old. Her father described her as slower to learn new things compared to his other children and did not think the school could serve her well when she was young, so he did not send her. He added that she requires directions repeated to her many times and needs extra help when learning a new task. He also added that she needs to work hard to overcome her difficulties. At the time of her enrollment, Fatuma demonstrated that she can recite the alphabet and recognize 12 out of 26 letters of the alphabet and count to 10 fluently. That's some, those are some good data points there too. Let me just say that because we love data. So your action steps. Um, so again, these are recommendations. Um, if the uh, language use survey, LUS, language use survey indicates a primary home language other than English, uh, you're going to screen with the leader screener online within 30 days of enrollment to determine multilingual learner status. And um, this says, as time permits, allow the student to settle into the new classroom routine before screening to determine if accommodations are needed. 
Um, if identified as a multilingual learner, begin to provide English language development programming and differentiation. Notify the special education leader to review Fatima's intake information and to advise next steps. Uh, arrange for any necessary supports for the student to begin school safely. Does the student need uh, some primary home language assistance? Uh, do they need a modified schedule to avoid crowded hallways? Um, so for example, if the student has to navigate a flight of stairs and it takes them a lot longer to do that, do they need to be dismissed before the transition happens a few minutes early um, or what else needs to happen? Um, if possible, you're gonna to try to assess Fatima's language and literacy skills in her primary language, given that we know that she didn't attend school until uh, later uh, in her development. Um, it would be surprising if they were uh, on par with her age. Uh, language Acquisition Committee may decide to notify the 504 planning team if a review of medical data warrants. And we do have um, a little bit of information from dad there. We're gonna begin the MTSS RTI referral process uh, and gather additional student data. So we wanna really monitor this student's um, progress. Again, just um, gathering data, um, looking if intervention is needed, noting it, and then, you know, regularly uh, determining if that intervention uh, is successful for that student. Developing that plan of progress monitoring with a timeline and frequent communication designed to keep the parents or guardians informed. Um, arrange for a PTOT to observe Fatima for consultation. And again, I think that would be something that you'd be um, working with your special education team leader there about that. And maybe Leora, you wanna weigh in on that. Um, and based on your progress monitoring data, the team will decide the appropriateness of a referral to special education. It's kind of blanked out at the bottom there, but I think it says, you know, if services. Um, do you want to say anything, Leora, about how that OTPT part might work? Yeah, so with a student who has um, a uh, a physical disability like Fatuba, it is entirely possible that the IEP team might choose to have um, OT evaluations done or PT evaluations done um, just to make sure that that injury or, um, you know, that situation with her hip isn't further, isn't a further barrier to her accessing faith. If she needs accommodations for that, dis for that disability, she can, um, you know, have those in section six of the IEP. And it may be that the IEP team feels like having OT or PT goals and that service on her IEP would be helpful for her as well. And I just want to interject, I wrote my email address wrong the first time I put it in. <laughs> Rookie mistake, I put in .com instead of .gov, so I apologize. It is actually leora.byers at main.gov. And I'd like, to, I'd like to address, oh, let's see, we have someone coming in. Um, Heidi made a comment about the wording recommendations makes it seem like there's um, flexibility and we use the term recommendations because we do have local control in the state of Maine. These recommendations are based on um, decisions from the Department of Justice in cases that the OCR brought against uh, various districts in New England. Uh, so these recommendations are based upon the determinate determinations that were made um, in those DOJ cases. Um, but um, in the state of Maine, we're, we're not able to mandate 
um, that. And so that's one of the differences um, between uh, the special education services and the ESOL programming services. Okay, I was not aware of that, Robin, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so case number four, this is Samuel. Um, Samuel speaks Portuguese and French. He was born in Angola and moved to Maine at the age of 16 and was enrolled in ninth grade. His English, English language proficiency is at the beginning of the developing level, level three. Samuel is a responsible and trustworthy caregiver of his younger siblings, and he makes friends easily and likes to play soccer and basketball. Um, his background experience, Samuel has been in the U.S. for 18 months. His family is seeking asylum in the U.S. The family shared that they had experienced several traumatic events before arriving in the U.S. Samuel's parents reported that he attended school in Angola when he was young and was an average student, but he didn't attend high school due to continuous moving to seek safety. And his learning challenges after 18 months in the U.S. and more than a year in high school, Samuel's teachers suspect a possible learning disability. Samuel has 80 minutes of English language support each day with a group of peers who are functioning at a similar language proficiency level. In addition, he has an ESOL teacher supported study skills class each day. Samuel is a friendly student who enjoys working in groups and with his peers. However, when Samuel's required to complete assignments or projects independently, he becomes resistant to the expectations and rarely completes the assignments. He also ignores the teacher's offers for after-school support. Samuel is failing several of his classes because he's not completing the expectations of the classes. His teachers are concerned that he will not meet the requirements to graduate. So some, these are the action steps for Samuel. Um, the first is that Samuel's teacher should talk with him with the assistance of an interpreter to ask probing questions that might help him share why he's not completing assignments and why he won't stay after school for additional support when needed. Um, a language acquisition committee meeting should be organized when all of Samuel's teachers can be present with the parents with an interpreter if needed to review Samuel's current status in each class and what he needs to do in order to meet the expectations of his classes. Teachers should use data that examines student language development performance during meaningful activities rather than only focusing on the use of isolated components of language. His ESOL case manager should record notes of the meeting. Third, um, the third is to assess Samuel's language and literacy proficiency in his primary home language. The MTSS RTI process should be started to identify interventions and activities that will facilitate the development of academic language and literacy in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner. And finally, develop a plan for progress monitoring with a timeline. Involve Samuel with the progress monitoring process communicate frequently with his parents to keep them informed. Do you wanna add anything to that, Robin? I, I do. I, um, I feel like I want to revise these action <laughs> steps. Uh, and uh, when, when we're asking those probing questions um, to find out why Samuel is not completing his assignments, um, I think we want to, um, think about his uh, moving around to be safe. And he's 16 years old. And is he affected by trauma in his past? And are there some supports that he needs to um, deal with that? And looking at that uh, emotional component of who Samuel is, and does he have some PTSD? Um, does he need any counseling services? And that's something that's not addressed here in these action steps, but um, it certainly um, has to have affected him in some way. And so I think that might be something that we look to revise in the future. That's a good idea. 
All right. Are there any questions that people either want to come on and ask or haven't gotten a chance to put in the chat box yet? Well, you know that you can always uh, email Leora and my, or myself um, if you do have questions. Um, and even if, if you have a student and um, amongst your staff, you're questioning um, what the action steps might be, you can always reach out to us and we will try our best to um, give you some thoughts about that. And I, th I think the next slide does have our contact information or the one after this, right? So if you um, complete the feedback survey, you will get a little thank you for doing that. And the thank you will include a link to a contact hour certificate. And so you just print that out and fill in your name if you need that, that's the way that you can access that contact hour um, certificate. And your feedback helps us to know how to plan and what you need for the future. And let's see, when parents decline an interpreter, I want to be respectful of their voice. However, in some situations, it would be beneficial advice on how to handle these situations. So really the district needs an interpreter um, for, for themselves, All right? So a parent may decline at the beginning of the meeting, but if a parent decides that they have a question to ask as the meeting progresses, uh, you want to be able to understand that question or to understand if the parent is having a conversation with someone else that they're bringing um, that you're able to know what the people are saying to one another. So you can share with the parents that you're, you have an, um, an interpreter there for uh, the school district. Um, so that is um, a legal thing to do and has been done many times. And that would be my advice. Okay, nice. I guess I would also advise, I mean, if you do run into a situation um, where there's no interpreter, um, you wanna have a waiver that um, the parent signs um, indicating that they understood that the interpreter was available and they declined the offer for services. Is, and that would there, be some, pardon? I'm, I'm wondering, is there a specific form for that or would it just be? Typically districts have their legal team write that uh -huh. waiver for them. And, and once, it's, once it's done, you have it and can, you know they sort of make it general. So you fill in the date mm -hmm. and, and the names of the people who you know, are um, making that. Uh, agreement. That's good to know. I didn't know that either. I can send you an example of one. Okay. Well, if folks are all set, then we are. Oops, let me stop sharing. There we go. There we go. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you taking time out of your afternoon um, to uh, learn a little bit more about all of this. Okay, awesome. I'm going to stop recording. All right. Well, thank you.